Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I want you to stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord together together today and let's just ask God to be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Father, here's our hearts. Fill it with your ways. I personally pray, Lord, that not a person in this room will hear from me, but they will hear from you. And God, they will hear your word today because the teacher is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us this day. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our brothers and sisters, our Baptist brothers and sisters, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis Inland Christian Center. We thank you for the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. Thank you for the Way, Emmanuel Baptist, Trinity, Ecclesia Church, Lord. We thank you, God, for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. But we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory of the building of the body of Christ go to you. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, as you take your seat, get your Bible, go with me to Luke, the 19th chapter. It's surprising because I'm so used to saying Hebrews, but... We're going to take a little sidestep for the next couple of weeks because of the two special weeks that are upon us. And we're going to go somewhere very different. Of course, this week, is, if you'll remember, is the triumphant week of Jesus Christ's entry into Jerusalem. A week later, he's crucifixion. I want to just get your heart prepared for some things. But before I do, I just want to share with you some truths. I love you very much. I care so much about you. I've been doing this for a lot of years. You wouldn't be here if you didn't know I love you. But I want to share with you, I love you so much that I refuse to play games with you and I refuse to compromise the word of God for you. I love you so much and I believe in you so much and trust you so much in your own personal intelligence and ability with God that I can share the word of God and it is sometimes going to rub you the wrong way. And the reason it's going to rub you the wrong way is because your flesh is in the way. And you have to get the flesh out of the way in order to be and do what God's called you to be and do. There are some things you're going to see today in the word of the Lord. Yes, it's the story out of Luke, the 19th chapter, about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. If you're any kind of a Christian, been around for any years, you've heard the story many times. I don't want to just teach you the story, that's a great story, of how triumphant he was when he came into Jerusalem. I've always taught you this. There's the obvious in the word of God And then there is that which is not so obvious, but is saying something deep and meaningful. And sometimes when you get to the deep and meaningful and you start to see it, it kind of awakens who you are and who God is in your life. And like I said, it can rub you the wrong way or you can take it as a time of growth and excitement and fulfillment. God... Let me say it again. God wants to speak to you today that when you walk out of this place, you will never be the same. I'm not here just to conduct like the love boat captain another church service. I'm here under commission of God to build the kingdom of God. I'm here under the commission of God to take the people of God 
and build them so strong in the ways of the Lord that everything they do and speak and say and go, they will be blessed by the Lord and nothing stops the army of God. If you don't know what the plan of God is and you don't know what the word of God says, hear me now, you will just do what you think instead of what God says and you will fail in life. Today you will see people who have compromised their relationship with God. They go to church, they sing, they hear the word, they praise his name, they do all the right things, but when they die, they will go to hell. And someone needs to tell you there's a relationship with God that he is literally calling the church to that is a mighty and dynamic relationship. And without that, you are not, and nor am I, going to make it. And you can find it in the word of the Lord clearly as you are sitting there and see it for yourself. The message title, if you're making notes, is Knowing the Time. There's a people who know the time and respond to God the right way. There's a people who don't know the time and mess up with God and fail in their lives. Which do you want to be? There's a people that know the time and apply the things of God to their life and become blessed. There's a people who don't know the time, apply what they think God is saying, and become cursed. I'll show you in Scripture. Clearly in the New Testament, somebody needs to love you enough not to play games with you, but tell you about the important hour so you do not miss the time of the Lord. Is anybody listening? In, that, in the book of Luke, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start to read and I'm going to start to explain. You're going to see the disciples of God and what a disciple is all about. And then you will see people who think they are disciples but are not disciples of God and end up in chaos and fail. Interesting. Fascinating. All from the triumphant entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. A magnificent and marvelous and fabulous time when the king of glory is finally exalted upon the earth and the people have seen the things that he has done and see the miracles and hear of them and see them with their own eyes and some of them have even experienced it and they're praising his name but there's a whole group of people who are not. But they think they're right with God when they are not. Is that you? Let's make sure it's not. Today is a cool day with God. Are you ready for an adventure of your life? I'm going to take you, Luke 19th chapter. I'm going to read, and I will explain a verse at a time as we look at the word disciple. Here's what it says in verse 29 in the 19th chapter of Luke. And it came to pass that when he draw near into Bethage and Bethany at the mountain called Avalet, that he sent two of his disciples. They're going ahead of him as he's going into Jerusalem. I want you to take your pencil if you have a pencil or pen and I want you to circle the word disciples. Here, God is calling upon his disciples. What a lot of people don't understand is when we talk about disciples, we only think of the 12, and the one that failed and therefore there's really only 11 disciples of Jesus Christ. Not true. Everybody that's born of the Spirit of God should be and is called by God to be a disciple. If you don't know what a disciple is, you won't do it. If you don't know what God sees in a disciple, you can't be it. But if you are born of the Spirit of God and God, Lord Jesus is your Savior, then you are called to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he has now called two disciples. And let me give you a definition, if I may, of a disciple. As one who believes in and helps disseminate. The word disseminate means to spread. He believes in and helps disseminate or spread the teaching of a master. A disciple is one who believes this and then helps to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus calls upon two of them to do something very important in their life and in your life because he's now describing to you what a disciple is really all about and what they look like so that you and I can live our lives out as disciples of the Lord. If someone doesn't share that with you, you will think that you only need to come to church, hear the music every now and then, sing the songs, keep beat to the music, listen to someone's Reader's Digest suggestion on how to do life, and then you leave and you think you're okay with God when in fact you are not. So let's talk. Someone who believes and helps spread the teaching of the Master. His two disciples. Now here he starts to describe what they are to do. In describing starting in verse number 30 what they are to do, we see something about the very character and nature of a disciple. Remember, you're called to be one, so you ought to know what they're to be like. In verse number 30 he comes along and he makes this statement saying, go into the village opposite of you. Whereas you enter in, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it to me. Here we find in verse number 30, he says, go into a village opposite you. He doesn't tell this disciple to go someplace where he's familiar. Oftentimes, God is going to tell a disciple to do something. They don't know where to go, how to go, or where to be. It's going to be something that is different than their normality, someplace different. You've got to be prepared that when the master asks you to do something, it may not be something you're familiar with. It may be something you're going to have to go and do. That means you're going to have to trust that when he asks you to do something, you trust him enough to do it. Amen. Whereas you enter in, you will find a colt tied. Circle the word tied. It would have been just fine with me if it had been a colt wandering around in the pasture, a colt down some old dirt road, or a colt loose somewhere. But when you've got a colt, what happens to be, if you will, a colt of a donkey, and it happens to be tied, may I say this to you, that indicates that there is ownership and someone cares about that colt. He oftentimes is going to take you someplace and you're going to see something that you're going to understand and then he's going to make a request of you and he says, on which no one has ever sat, loose it, bring it here. Now wait a minute. He just asked them to do something that in the natural would have stopped every one of us. Is that not stealing? Is that not going into a village that you don't know, you're not familiar with? Is that not following God someplace where you don't understand? You're going to have to really trust him to do what he tells you to do. You're going to have to be now a disciple is obedient to what he says. And now he's making a request you don't understand. I would have stopped right there and said, wait a minute. I can get you some other animal, but why are you having me get one that's tied up? You know, the owner tied him up because the owner wants to keep him. And the owner is watching over him. He must have some value. You're asking me to go and bring him and rip him off and bring him back to you? I'm not going there. And oftentimes, you're going to have to come to a place where you're not only trusting God, you'll hear and obey and follow God, even when it doesn't make sense to you, even when it's difficult for you to figure out, you know why? Because you've come to a place in your life where you have settled that God is just. No matter what he says, no matter what it is, you've got to see God as just. 
Oftentimes in your life and in my life, we will see things that are contrary to our own thinking. Sometimes you will do things that you won't understand. Quite frankly, I'm personally tired of praying for people who die. So therefore, I go to God and I say, God, I don't understand. And God says, am I just? I have to say, yes, Lord. Even though I don't understand it, God. Even though I can't figure it out, God. I know you know the big picture and I know you are a just God. And for every one of us that are in here, we're going to have to come to a place of realizing that if I'm going to be obedient, and if I'm going to trust, and if I'm going to see him as the one I'm going to follow, and if I'm going to be that disciple, I'm going to have to come to a place that no matter what happens in my life, God is still God, and he's on the throne, and he knows the big picture, and he's okay. Are you following me? Because that's a bizarre verse right there. Then the next verse comes along, verse number 31, and it says, And if anyone asks you why you have loosed it, thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Have you ever noticed how God is in control? He already knows the outcome of something before it ever happens. In other words, you and I have got to come to a place in our walk as disciples that we not only trust him, we not only obey him, we not only follow him, we not only have claimed him to be just, but we have got to come to a place where we know without a shadow of a doubt he's in control. Notice what he says. If anyone asks you, then he comes along and he says these words. He says, tell him. He knows it's not a woman. He knows it's not a people. He knows it's a man going to question them. He's got it all set up. God is in control. And he says these words, listen to this, and I love these words. He says, because the Lord has need of them. In other words, a disciple makes it very clear. It's not about what I think, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to make it. I'm going to trust. I'm going to follow. I'm going to obey. I'm going to go where God would have me to go. I'm going to believe God no matter if it's different than my own thinking that he's a just God. I know he's in control. I remember a time in my life as a young pastor, I hadn't quite settled that issue in my life. A couple came to our church and they were really excited about the things of God. I was only about 34, 35 years old. Debbie was probably about 29 years old. I I just wanted to please God. I I don't even know what what I was preaching in those days. But I was just out there and this couple came and they just loved the church. They had four kids. And I found out after a few weeks that they would come every week to church and they literally had moved to the mountains of Lake Arrowhead where we had our church and they were camped in a tent. That's not a problem except winter is coming and winter is upon us. And they've got four children in a tent. Then I found out after a few weeks that, uh, that this was a convicted felon that he had already gone to court and he had already been convicted. And he was between the time he had been convicted and the time of sentencing, and he was at our church with his four children in a tent. We scraped up whatever money we could and got them out of the tent and got them into a little teeny house with the four kids. At least they could take a hot bath. At least they could uh, not have the wind blow through their tent at night or the snow that was starting to fall be upon those children. We put them in a a little tent. I'll never forget it. I mean, in a little house from the tent. I'll never forget it. Then one day, the man comes to me and he says, I'm going to be sentenced. It's an eight-year sentence, and I want to know if you'll go to court with us. They left the kids behind. The four of us, Debbie and I, and the wife and the husband, went to court that day, Orange County. I sat there in the courtroom as he was going to be sentenced. The judge was violent. The judge was angry. He was mad. He was telling this man off for what he had done. He was already convicted, and now he's going he's to sentence him, and it's an eight-year sentence uh, for this grand theft of, of conviction over him. He's going to go to jail. And all the time he's there, I'm thinking like a young dumb kid. I'm thinking, how am I going to take care of the wife and kids? (laughs) God, I'm broke. I can hardly take care of my own kids. But I knew it was in me as a pastor to help them and to take care of them. 
And I remember that time when I prayed, and I remember this one verse popped into my heart that said, Proverbs 21, 1, that says that God says the heart of the king is in his hand, and he'll turn it whatever way he wants it to go. And I said, God, the heart of the king's in your hand. There's the judge. Turn his heart. I no sooner said that when the judge dropped his head and the whole court got silent. No one moved. There wasn't a stirring or a moving. You could have heard a pin drop in the place. I'm telling you, for me, it was like five minutes long. I just stared around and said, what's going on? Then the judge raised his head, took the gavel, and slammed it down and let the man go, put a wristwatch on him, and put him in a, in, a, in a routine where he checks in. He was not in prison at all. He could continue getting a job. And only two things he could do was get a job and go to church. And I had to learn that God was in control. So as a disciple, I had to learn to trust. I had to learn to follow. You'll have to learn to be obedient. You'll have to learn to make him just because oftentimes you're going to face things you do not understand and you will not get the answer to the prayers that you think you should have. But guess what? He is still God and he is also very much in control. But these last words, a disciple, because the Lord has need of it, now to the disciple. God's will has got to be first. And the need of the Lord has got to be number one. Verse number 32 comes along and it says this, and those who were sent their way and they found it just as the Lord had said. Man, just what God says is what comes to pass. Verse 33, but as they were loosening the colt, the owners of its, the owners, did you notice the plural there? wasn't one person that owned it. There was more. That animal had great value. Tied up, now owned not by one, but more than one. Said these words, listen to this. Why are you loosening the coat? I need to say this because this is San Bernardino. Don't go giving the police an excuse when you jump into somebody's Mustang and hotwire that sucker and say that God told you to do it. I'm here to tell you, you're going to jail and I'm not visiting you. <laughs> Verse number 34. And they said, the Lord has need of it. Faith, confidence, obedience, following. Someone who knows that God's just, God's in control, and God's needs are more important than your own needs. Which brings us to verse 35. And they brought him to, to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt. Have you ever saw that before? They threw their own clothes on the colt. Do you know what that's saying? I want you to know that people in those days didn't have closets like you have. They can't go to Kmart and buy five shirts for 20 bucks. They had one stitch of clothes. Most people took all year long for them to stitch the clothes. It would take someone almost a year to beat the clothes out, stitch it, and weave it together, and then bring it to a close. It was very expensive to have clothes. And when you took your clothes and you threw them down, what you're really saying is the value of God is more important than my own personal wealth. Most people, it's the other way. I want my own personal wealth, and I will give God a little bit. And they're making a statement with what's important to them and what is valuable to them by taking their clothes and putting it on the cold. Notice this. Also, it goes on and says, and they set Jesus on him. What is that? Why didn't it say that Jesus climbed upon him? Why didn't it just say that Jesus threw his leg over them? It didn't. The disciples set Jesus on him. Why does it say that? 
Your job as a disciple is to take Jesus and to display him to a lost and dying world. And it's going to cost you something of your own personal wealth for it to happen. That's why you bring your tithe and offering to the house of God, a real place that does something with it and tells somebody about Jesus building the kingdom of God. And in verse number 36, it comes along and it says, And he went, many spread their clothes on the road, and all the disciples have now taken their values and thrown it at the feet of the donkey as Jesus walks by. Wow, what an expression. Verse number 37, And then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude and the disciples began to rejoice and, and pray and the disciples began to re, and the disciples began to rejoice and the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud with a loud with a loud voice for all of the mighty works they had seen blessed is the king who comes in the name of the lord peace on heaven and glory to the highest all of a sudden these people can't keep quiet. Let me tell you something about a real disciple. They trust God. They follow God. They hear God. They go places they may not understand or know where they can be comfortable in. They're people who know that God's just. They know that God's in control. And let me tell you something. They're not afraid of putting down their own value to see Jesus lifted up. And may I say this to you? Listen close. Listen to this. You cannot shut up a disciple. And that's why we come into the house of God and there's such a noisy place here. Because we're disciples of Jesus. Has anybody listened? And I want you to hear this. No sooner do you open your mouth that some negative person's going to try to stop you. No sooner are you going to try to be a disciple before someone comes along and puts you down. No sooner is it going to make an expression. You're going to walk in trust, walk in faith, believe God, follow God. You're going to be obedient to the ways of God. You're going to make him just no matter what happens. You're going to know he's in control. You're going to take your value and, and make sure he's placed on that colt. But guess what? All of a sudden, here comes somebody who's in the world trying to stop you. But I want you to know something. Nothing can stop the shout unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 39, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You come into this place, and let me tell you something, you're quiet, the walls are going to sing praises to the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Being a disciple is one who hears and follows, one who trusts and believes, one who knows and makes God a just God no matter what they see or experience, one who understands that God is always in control, one who's not afraid to take their personal wealth and lift it up and give it to Jesus, and also will take Jesus and display Jesus to a lost and dying world. And a disciple is somebody who can't keep his mouth shut. And that's what we're building here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Is anybody listening? Now here's a day of joy. He's coming in. They're shouting praises to him. They're thanking God for him. Salvation is at hand, they're saying. They're waving palm leaves as Jesus comes in. Jesus, I would have thought, would have been excited alive, have a smile on his face and happy in his heart. Notice what the word of God says, verse number, if you will, 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Jesus will always draw near, he will always see, and he will respond with personal feelings. He will draw near to you. He will see you. And he will either weep over you 
or he will rejoice over you. And that's your call, not mine. Are you following me? And here Jesus looks at the city. Behind him is all the people that are praising God. In front of him is a whole city of people who don't want anything to do with him. Do these people go to the temple? Church? Absolutely. First place he goes is into the temple. There's people there. In the temple they hear the word. In the temple the scriptures read. In the temple they pray. In the temple they're believing God for stuff. In the temple they're doing the right things. But all of these people in the temple and all of these people in that city are losers. Even though they had God in their thinking and in their mind and in their activity and in their lifestyle, they lost. Read the verses. Look at it with me. Verse number 42. If you had known, even you especially in the, your day, it was your day that he came. The things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when the enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave and you and one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. How we can get caught up in religious stuff. We can go into the house of God. We can be on the side of God and still miss God unless we get ourselves on who he is, not on who we are. We can still go to the house. We can sing the songs. We can hear the scripture. We can clap our hands and still miss God if your heart's not right with God. Are you following me? These people were people that were in the temple and they failed. He's prophesying about the year 70 A.D. and many times since then that Jerusalem was torn down and everything came to pass and not a stone was up, uh, left standing and uprooted. Someone says, how can that happen? It can happen to you. It can happen to me. I'm going to pop up a couple of verses. John, the 12th chapter. Watch this. Verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, we're talking about spiritual rulers, my friends, people that were the head of the church, the synagogues and the temples. Even among the rulers, many, not a few, not once in a while, many believed in capital H, him, Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, because of the rules of men, because of the ways of men, because of the, the organization and traditions and ceremonial rituals of men, the Pharisees, they did not confess him. At least they should be put out of church. Let me tell you something. Throw me out of church if you want, but you'll never throw me out of Jesus. Are you following me? Verse number 43, watch this. This is a good verse. For they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. And when you love the praises of men that you fit in with what men think, you'll never be the disciple that God wants you to be. You'll be too afraid to trust him. You won't be too afraid to follow him. You'll be too afraid to be obedient to him. You'd be too afraid to see him as just and too weary to see him as in control. You'll never come into a place where you'll give of yourself for the betterment of someone else. And you'll find yourself over and over and over again finding yourself in trouble with God because you're too weary with the things of the Lord. 
Because you care more about what men say and what men act like and what men do instead of what God tells us to do. But we are different at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We're going to be the real disciples that God wants us to be, that he paid the price for us to be. And we will have a shout in the land. We don't care about the people who want to shut us up. You cannot shut us up. And you will either be on the road with Jesus or in the city with the religious people. Your call. Not mine. Your call. This church will either implode because of the lack of character of God in it or it will explode because of the character of God that's being built inside of every one of us. You can trust him. You can follow him. You can see him as just. You can know that he's in control. You can place a value on him greater than the personal wealth that you have. You can be a person that has a shout everywhere you go and nobody is going to shut us up about Jesus. Come on, somebody. You say, Pastor Jim, you're radical. I am. You know why? Because I love you. And I read my Bible. Blowing smoke and incense on you is not even going to get you anywhere. But getting the word of God on the inside of you changes your home, your family. Your children are like Elijah's children that are four years old praying for the healing of people. Marriages, you're more in love at an old age than you were at a young age. It's the way it ought to be when you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because I love you, I'm telling you like it is. And it's the way it will be at this church. So it's your call. Go to the city. It's going to implode. Or get on the road. And let's see Jesus lifted high in this place. If God spoke to you today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise the Lord. Come on now. Just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Just want to remind you, Friday night, there's a bunch of services, but one starts at five, and that's the movie, The Passion. It is hard to see. If you haven't seen it, Debbie loves to look at it every year because it brings her heart back to where it needs to be. It's free. It starts at five o'clock. Then at seven o'clock is communion. So many of you need to have communion. Communion service around here is really unique, and you're going to enjoy communion. Easter communion service on Sunday I mean, excuse me, on Friday night at 7 o'clock. And don't forget, La Roca is also having their services. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Here's what I'm going to ask all of you to do. Nobody get up. Nobody leave. When you get up and leave, are you listening? Are you listening? When you get up and leave, you disturb the people around you. At that very moment, God may have been speaking to their heart when you got up and disturbed them and they didn't hear, and they didn't get right with God. Today, for a lot of you that are in this room, if you don't know the time, God has brought you here for a reason. That's why you're here. Today is your day to get into a place where you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is a divine appointment you have with God. You've had a lot of appointments with attorneys and doctors, painters and plumbers. But you have a divine appointment with God today in this house. And God brought you here to get right with God. Maybe you've been in the city long enough, and you know what I mean. Now it's time to get out of the city and get on the road with Jesus. And it's time to become that disciple that God wants you to be. And it only comes when you get born again. So a lot of times we think we're okay with God because we're going to go to heaven. We think, you know, we're nice people or good people and that'll get us to heaven. 
But nowhere in the Bible does it say because you're nice or good is going to get you to heaven. You're not going to make it. So many times we think we're going to make it because our mom and dad told us we were Christians when we were kids and they took us to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible to say your mom and dad can tell you a Christian makes you a Christian. Sometimes we say we love God or we just hope if we die we're going to go to heaven. There's no reason to do that. You're not going to make it and somebody needs to love you enough to tell you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. You can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there his way. In John, the third chapter, he tells us exactly how to get to heaven. He says, you must be born again. Most people that attend American churches don't know what born again means. I'll tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what born again means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been always will be. God forgive us in some American churches where we watered that down. But I'm here to tell you it's all or nothing and I will prove it to you by the scripture. The words of Jesus in the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. When I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What did he just really say? He really said that people that are lukewarm are not real Christians, even though they call themselves Christians. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out, little up, little down. Here's lukewarm. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. God is something, but he's not your everything. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm, my friends. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to stop playing church and tell you like it is. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. He won't steal it from you. He's not a thief. He's not a crook or a conniver to talk you out of it or a manipulator to make you do this. He could have made a trillion robots that look just like you to worship him, but he didn't. He gave you a free will choice. Now today in this house, safe and friendly place, will you choose to give God all of your heart and choose to give God all of your life or will you continue to not know the time and the time of his visitation? He's calling you home and today is your day of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? How do I do that? Well, let's don't do it my way or your way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. If you confess me before men, in a moment I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang, when you hear that sound. Bang, your hand goes up all over this auditorium, back in the family rooms that are full, in the foyer for sitting out there. If you're listening down at the restaurant and you got yourself out there, if you're down at the plaza with your Bible and you hear my voice right now, I'm talking to you, get ready before God to put your hand up. Today is your day. If you're online in one of those 40 countries and you haven't given God all of your heart and given God all of your life, today is your day. God's watching you right where you're at and get ready to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. Who should raise her hand if you've been running from God? Instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are, I'm speaking to you. Today is your appointment with God. Don't miss the time. Today is your deal. Make sure if you're not sure, today is your day. Are you ready? I'm counting to three. Here it is. One, two, 
three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two. Thank you. Back here. There's three. Thank you. Four. Thank you. There's five. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. There's six back in that family room. Back over on this side. There's six wise people. There's seven. Thank you. Anybody else? There's eight back here. God bless you. Nine. You can put your hand up. Come on. You need to get your hand up. This is not messing around with God. Don't miss this time. There's nine wise people. There's ten back over here. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 11. There's 12. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Where are you? You need to get your hand up. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Get your hand up. Thank you. There's 13. There's 14. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else? Don't, don't miss this. You keep missing this. You keep missing this. Anybody else? There's 14 wise people going to give your heart and life to Jesus. Become a disciple of Christ. 14. There's 15. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody? I already counted them. I already counted them. There's 14. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 14 wise people. I believe there's another 10. I believe there's 14, but I believe there's another 10 of you that didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. Is that you? Then listen closely. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, all 14 of you. Once you get a hold of your stuff, bring a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle, meet me in front. I don't want anybody to leave during this period of time. I want you to get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend. Check with your neighbor, because I'm telling you, there's at least 10 or 15 more of you that need to get out of your seat and come. If you're in the foyer telling usher, they'll let you in. If you're in the family rooms and you raise your hand, bring your children and get down here right now. Come on, let's stand and welcome them as they come. Let's give them a hand as they come. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on home. You're all I ever need. Come on, if you raise your hand, come on up here. You're all I want. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I know you are near. Come on, you come. Give them a hand, they're still coming. Come on, give them a hand. You can come too. There's time for you. Don't miss the time. Know the time and come. Hurry though, hurry. Well, all of you, thank God you have come. All of you, look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff. We love the word free around here. And then he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Those are friends that will help you get strong in Jesus. Remember, you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said that. You said you're going to give God all of your life. You said that. Let us help you to do it. We don't want you to go back, fall through the cracks, go back to the old ways. We want you to go on in the victory of God. We're going to, remember this, get out of the city and get on the road for Jesus. That's what this is all about. You can make that choice today by getting yourself a spiritual personal trainer. So he's going to lead you in a prayer, give you some free stuff, tell you about the program, meet a friend before church service. He'll tell you all about it. It only takes a few moments. People you came with, they'll wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> 